The Walwell dragon in Polish folklore terrorized 13th century Krakow, and it lived in the cave at Walwell Hill, a place you can still visit. But eventually it was tricked into eating some cows stuffed with sulfur, and it died. But it did lend its name to the fossil animal Smok Wawelesi. Now, Smok comes from the Polish for dragon, pretty straightforward. I mean, the fossils we have of Smok include some pretty nasty teeth that it definitely would have been using to eat other things. But also, again, Wawelesi, it's literally named after this specific dragon, not just any generic dragon in Polish folklore. Smok lived during the Triassic, a very tumultuous time in Earth's history, especially for a lot of life, I would say. It was bracketed by a mass extinction at the beginning and a mass extinction at the end. But Smok, for at least its time in Poland, did really, really well. From what we can tell, it was probably the dominant predator of that environment. We really don't find other things that were likely eating other large prey. Meanwhile, we have pretty solid evidence that Smok was definitely eating other large prey. But unfortunately for us, Smok has a lot of weird features that make it hard to narrow down exactly what it was. And so there's kind of two main hypotheses. The first is that it was a Pseudosuchian. This is the lineage that would eventually lead into crocodiles, but during the Triassic, they were mostly on land and they were very successful. You have things like Poposaurus or Prestosuchus or Postosuchus, all of which would have been around at the same time or a bit earlier during the Triassic and definitely were the top predators in their environments. Meanwhile, you have some of the first dinosaurs also evolving during this time. And if Smok was one of these, it was one of the largest of them during the Triassic. And again, would have just been this kind of precursor for what would come after the Triassic. Because the Rasukians and the Pseudosuchians were much more successful during the Triassic than the dinosaurs. And this is because the Pseudosuchians during the Triassic probably ate more dinosaurs than were eaten by dinosaurs. They were the top predators. The dinosaurs weren't quite there yet. There were a few large ones that may have been competing, like Herrerasaurus earlier, but again, for the most part, you have larger things like the Rawasukians that were dominating those predator niches. But during the end Triassic mass extinction, there was a massive shift in these kind of ecosystems where suddenly dinosaurs became much more successful and the Pseudosuchians kind of just died out, other than those that stuck to water and became the modern day crocodilians. And yeah, they had a few different offshoots that went back to land, but for the most part, the crocodilians were kind of like what we know now, they mostly hung around water. So what was Smok? Was it this kind of last holding on to the main predator niche of the Pseudosuchians? Or was it a precursor of the larger theropods to come? Unfortunately, it has a lot of features that fit into both of these groups. And for this, we're actually just gonna start at the front of the head because, I mean, that way we can move down the whole body. Now, by looking at the skull bones we do have, we have a very good sense that Smok was an archosaur, the group that includes both the Pseudosuchians and the dinosaurs. But again, where exactly on that kind of spectrum between those in evolutionary terms it actually ends up, it depends on what you're looking at. But as for the archosaur parts, it has things like a mandibular fenestra and an antorbital fenestra. The mandibular fenestra is this hole on the bottom jaw that it would have used to attach some muscles to in order to help it have a stronger bite. Meanwhile, on the top part of the head, you have the antorbital fenestra, which ant is just anterior and orbit is orbital, so like the eye. So it's in front of the eye. It's pretty straightforward once you understand the jargon. The teeth are also a really good indicator that it was an archosaur because the teeth are serrated, and we don't really find serrated teeth in most other reptile groups. So it's, again, really solid evidence that, yeah, this is an archosaur. It's big, it's in the Triassic, it checks all the boxes. So cool. But there's not a gap where the maxilla bone meets the premaxilla bone. Early pseudosuchians like Riohasuchus and also early theropods like Coelophysis have a little gap in odd spacing of their teeth right there. So again, it doesn't fit perfectly into either of these groups. Just behind that though, there is that antorbital fenestra I mentioned earlier. And in general, dinosaurs, you can look at things like Herrerasaurus. It's kind of this big round antorbital fenestra. Meanwhile, a lot of the early Pseudosuchians, such as Postosuchus, had a much more triangular-shaped fenestra here. And meanwhile, when we look at Smok, yeah, it's kind of more triangular, so it looks like it probably fits a little bit better into the Pseudosuchians now. Just behind the antorbital fenestra, though, is parts of the brain case. And the brain case looks a whole lot more like a dinosaur's brain case than it does like a Pseudosuchian's. So we're shifting back again the other way. And it specifically looks like some of the larger theropods later on, like Allosaurus, 
This is in part because there's attachments on the outside of the brain case for the pterygoideus muscles, which they're just larger in the brain case of smock, like they are in many dinosaurs. So hey, that's a good line of evidence that maybe that's where it was, maybe it is that precursor. Sticking with the more dinosaur-like idea, there's also the supratemporal fenestra, which are the little holes on the top of the skull where your muscle attachments would go. And in these, they're actually enlarged. They start to push into the frontal bone on the skull, something that we don't see in Pseudosuchians, but we do see in dinosaurs. However, there's also a post-frontal bone, meaning it's just behind the frontal bone, and the Pseudosuchians and the theropod dinosaurs don't have this. So again, it's it's some arguments for dinosaur, some arguments for not a dinosaur and a Pseudosuchian, and some arguments for it doesn't fit either of these well. The brain case also wasn't pneumatized, meaning essentially there weren't air sacs helping to support the brain case, but we find those air sacs or evidence of those air sacs in both Pseudosuchians and in dinosaurs. So it's quite literally this perfect mix of some traits from each group, but no complete set of traits that prove it to be in either group very definitively, as long with having these traits that are just not aligned with either group at all. It's wild to see it being so different, but so similar in so many ways. One of the best things about archosaurs, though, is that we don't know them from just skulls. We have the whole rest of the body to look at. And while Smock isn't super complete, and the bones weren't all perfectly arranged, they were all found within the same 3.5 meter flood deposit. And again, in close proximity, they all line up to about the right size animal, and like the skull, which has all these features, the hips and other parts of the body also have features which align it with potentially multiple or neither groups. So let's look at the hips. And again, the hips are important for archosaurs because archosaurs were really the first reptiles to start to be upright. And you can actually see that even today in modern crocodilians, especially alligators, which can high walk pretty adeptly. And a lot of the answer to how they actually stood up properly was based in the hips. And so we can look at the hips of Smock and see what we can find. And what we find is kind of a host of different issues. One of the most distinctive differences between Pseudosuchian and Dinosaurian hips is a perforated acetabulum. An acetabulum is something that you also have, it's just where the femur meets the ball socket in the hips. But perforated in dinosaurs just means there's a hole that goes all the way through and that's where that bone sits. Meanwhile, when we look at Smock, it's almost perforated, but not really. Certainly not to the same degree it is in dinosaurs. However, on the bone itself, there's this kind of little buttress of bone, which is how the Pseudosuchians started to get more upright. They essentially had this bone come out on their hips, and then their ball socket of their femur would fit underneath that, and that helped them stand more upright. And Smock does have that, so again, more evidence for a Pseudosuchian relationship, even though it still kind of has a perforated acetabulum, which you don't see in things like the Pseudosuchians. In fact, you can look at this hip of Poposaurus and see that it's not perforated because there's just, it's not entirely enclosed. Meanwhile, again, Smock has this entirely enclosed acetabulum, but it's not perforated the same way a dinosaur's hips are. Now, if we do take that evidence of, hey, it at least had the buttress, so its legs were probably more like Pseudosuchians, there's a problem immediately below the hips. And that's on the front side of the femur, where there's a small knob of bone, which is like that in dinosaurs and would have led to extra muscle attachments leading to the femur up to the hips. So then suddenly again, we shift back to dinosaurs versus Pseudosuchians, or again, somewhere in the middle. It's really unclear. But fortunately, we're approaching one of the most diagnostic features of these kinds of animals, and that's the ankles. And essentially, does it have a crotarsalian ankle, or does it have an ornithodiran ankle, or sometimes an avametatarsalian ankle? This basically just dictates where the ankle actually folds when the animal is moving its foot. And there's different advantages to each. Modern day crocodilians still have the crotarsalian ankle, meanwhile, birds still have the avametatarsalian ankle. And as we look at Smock's legs, we can start to pan down, and you'll realize that there's no ankles. So one of the most important features that we could use to try and tell what it was is nowhere to be found, which is really, really unfortunate. But again, this is the only fossil that we have of it, and it was found in 2012, or at least described in 2012. So it's pretty dang recent. And that means there's probably a good chance we'll find more of it at some point. It's just we haven't just yet. But 
there are already people looking for more stuff out in parts of Poland from their Triassic rocks. And they've found some really interesting things that do relate to smock. Because technically there are other fossils of smock, it's just they're not body fossils, it's it's poop. They, we have poop fossils from smock. And we're pretty confident that they are from smock. In part because there's smock teeth inside of these copper lights, or fossilized poop. Now one of the first questions about this is going to be, hey, doesn't that mean that smock got eaten if it's bones and teeth or inside of itself, but it's only the teeth, not the bones. And that's really important because when you have animals like smock, it's possible that they were actually crunching on bones and occasionally breaking teeth and swallowing those with whatever they were eating. And that seems to be the case because alongside the teeth of smock, we find bones of a lot of different things, including some fish, some very indeterminate fragments of bone, and also some bone fragments from dicynodonts. Specifically, it's probably from Lizawikia, but again, Lizawikia was about the size of an elephant, smock wasn't that big, but at some point during the life cycle, it was probably prey for smock. And if it is a dinosaur, this honestly kind of leads into things like Tyrannosaurus rex much, much further down the line, because like Tyrannosaurus rex, smock was absolutely content just grabbing and crunching on bones as well as meat. So it's a much more kind of diverse ecology than we were actually expecting to come this early in the Triassic. Normally when you're trying to get those kind of resources, you need to wait until you're a much larger body size or have very specific adaptations for it. And we didn't necessarily see those adaptations right when Smock was described, but apparently it managed to crunch on bone just fine. And as something that would be kind of hard to test and especially hard to test with as limited the fossils of Smock that we have, it could again still just not belong to either the Pseudosuchians or the dinosaurs. Poland is not likely the place where the first dinosaurs evolved and even the Pseudosuchiates. Most of those early ones come from the Southern Hemisphere, parts of South America and Africa, mostly. So it's very possible that Smok just evolved in the Northern Hemisphere and was from an entirely different line of archosaurs. Meanwhile, as time progressed, those Pseudosuchians and dinosaurs that evolved in the Southern Hemisphere migrated northwards and eventually outcompeted animals like Smok. And we just don't know entirely how that story is because the fossil record is notoriously incomplete. Additionally, I mean, I will say in full defense to the current idea that it was a Pseudosuchian or a dinosaur, its lineage could have also evolved in South America and migrated northwards. There's nothing stopping that. But until we have a better fossil of smock, it's really hard to tell. And all of this just makes the Polish dragon have this incredibly bizarre suite of traits that we don't find in anything else. There's not really any animals we could say were closely related to it. And that's really frustrating for trying to understand how evolution took place, and how after the Triassic, the dinosaurs became what they were and the crocodilians became what they were, because we don't really know where Smok fits into the story. Was it the last of a stronghold of Pseudosuchians, or was it a precursor of things to come?